Great job. Thank you. Wonderful worship today. Um, it's awesome when you can uh, experience uh, the voices of worship. And, and uh, I liked it when Joey and Justin just was quiet and we heard the, the sound of the audience worshiping to God. That's a, that's a sweet thing. It talks about the condition of the heart. We're in a series called New. The, one of the most liberating words that you can come up with is new. Fresh. A do-over. Starting at the beginning of the year, you get to say, you know what, I've made a lot of mistakes. I have a lot of garbage within my life. I plead to God and I say, God, I, I want something fresh. And he wants to give us the tools in order to do that. Now, as we talked about over the last two weeks, it's not as easy as saying, I want, I want, I want. Because the old and the new, they are not compatible. Sometimes the thing that we once did is the thing that we desire. But the thing that we desire deep within our soul, and to make that change, we have to make some decisions. We have to make a concrete opinion that I need a fresh start. So we have to have a, a way to do that. We can't just allow circumstances to happen. So we have to, on purpose, make a decision to say, I want to start over. It's not just going to happen. We're not just going to have the magic pill. We're not just going to wake up and think, I'm a new person tomorrow. We can give our life to Christ, but we still have a desire in our bodies to do the things that we've always done. So we have to make a concrete decision to change and the Bible gives us that formula in order to do that. And it starts in Scripture found in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. It says this, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it will spring up forth. It shall be known unto you. I will make roads in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Another translation, it says... Consider the old things. Behold, I will do something new. Can you not perceive it? In other words, God, if we have an ultimate desire to do what he wants to do, he can supernaturally start doing the things, and our job is to perceive what he's doing. If we live our life pleasing to him, honoring to him, he can do the miraculous in our abilities. But here's the kicker. Jesus, through his son, God, through his son Jesus, wants to do miraculous things. But we have an adversary, don't we? Anybody ever talk to the adversary? Talk to him about every day. And his job is to destroy you. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I come that you may have life, and that you may have life more abundantly. And then he keeps on adding. He said, but there is a devourer that wants to destroy everything that you want. And that devourer, of course, is Satan. And what we have to do is if we want to make a concrete decision to move into the future, we have to be able to say no to the things of this world, no to the things of Satan, and turn our backs and say yes to the things of God. It is very difficult. But the Lord says, forget what has happened to you. Forget it. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, we cannot live in our past glory days nor can we live in our saddened days. Sometimes the glory days of our past has hindered God's work because we live in our past and our joy and our pride is in the past. So we turn off the future because we lived in the past. We need to forget it. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, the only thing that we should take glory in is what Christ has done for us. And then we need to turn our focus into the future. And think about the things that God wants to do for us. Think about the new life that God wants to give to us. Think about the new opportunities that God wants to do with us. I want to share with you how to make a fresh start. I want to give to you the formula. But in order to do this, I want to read this quote to you. And then I want to give you a very simple formula. And it's an acrostic to start. But it says, start. I hope you'll remember the past. It... I hope you remember this and pass it along to friends when they have failures. Regardless of what kind of failure you had in the past, you may have had the financial failure, 
maybe a relationship failure, a failure in your marriage. You may have a moral failure. You have been really blown away by what you have done and the decisions that you've been made. Maybe you're even ashamed of the decisions and you hope nobody ever finds out. Regardless of your failure of the past, there is hope for the future. Whatever it is. And we talk about that word, and we've talked about it many times, and that word is, you cannot move into the future until you have been forgiven of your present and forgiven of your past. And if we truly believe in the word forgiveness, the word forgiveness, and it said in the video, he is going to separate as far as the east is from the west. He's going to bury it in the deepest sea. He's going to throw it behind his back. It's as if it never happened. The only way that we're going to grasp the future and move into a new life is to understand that we have been forgiven of our past. Now, God forgives us. We accept God's forgiveness. We understand that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and the shedding of his blood forgives us all of our sins. We understand that spiritually. We understand that with Christ. But when the rubber hits the road and we have that depressive time and we're down and we're out and Satan puts it in our mind, but do you remember back? Do you remember when you did that? And the negativity of what you have done supersedes anything that you know and the negativity of what you think is in you brings it out and you forget the forgiveness that God did through you. We've got to remember the forgiveness. We've got to remember it. We have to hold on to it. We have to understand that we're baptized in the love of Jesus and the forgiveness of Christ, and we do not have to be held down to our past. But if we want to liberate ourselves from the past, there's some things that we have to do. We have to do these things and do it on point, on purpose. The Bible says die to ourselves daily, which means on a daily basis. I've got to get up and I've got to do something. You know, we're, we started this brand new ministry here called Right Now Ministries, and um, I hope that you've signed up for it. We're going to be signed up in the lobby out here, right out these doors after the service. And we're hoping that 100% of our church signs up for Right Now Ministries. Here, here's, here's why. It's because, you know, we're talking about Bible studies. We're talking about dying daily. There's thousands of videos, thousands of sermons, thousands of leadership, thousands of child rearing videos that you can clip on and you can watch a 15 minute clip even in the morning, lunch hour, at night. You can pull up your smartphone. You have 15 minutes you're waiting for your kids to get out of basketball practice. You can sit there and you can watch something and it's not for your enjoyment but it's for your, in so you can learn, so you can grow. If we do not do something different in the future, we will never change our past. So, what is the S? We need to stop making excuses. We gotta take ownership. You know, I know that there's a lot of bad things that happen. I know a lot of things have happened to us individually, which causes the path that we were on. But there comes to a point that the decisions that we make, we have to take ownership with them. A lot of people have hurt you. A lot of people have scarred you. A lot of things that have been done by innocent you, by guilty people, have hurt you. But I want to tell you, there's only one person that can ruin you, and that is yourself. People can hurt you all day long, and people will hurt you. But you cannot allow the people that hurt you to ruin you. Joseph said it this way, You meant it for evil. But God turned it to the good. And when we think about what God can do through our circumstances, we have to understand, I am going to stop making excuses. I'm not going to let others dictate how I live, when I live, and my soul. I am going to do what God wants me to do. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them... He gets another chance. I love that. You know, I'm just going to take ownership. I'm going to take ownership in my mistakes. I'm going to offer forgiveness to those that have hurt me, but it's my responsibility, it's my job to take ownership of what I have done. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, it says, 
A sensible man watches for problems and prepares to meet them, but the fool never looks ahead and suffers the consequences. We must look ahead. We must take ownership. We must take that responsibility. And then we need to have planning with good advice. You need to get the advice that you can, get good advice from people that you trust and that you know. You know, the Bible says also, pride always leads to destruction. And if we don't take ownership, what we can do, sometimes um, we just take, make these excuses about stuff, about the reason why we're doing what we're doing and the path that we're on. And we can find an excuse for anything that we want. We can justify almost anything that we'd like to justify. But there's some things that we just have to say, you know what, if it's right, it's right. If it's not, it's not. And quit making excuses and let the, let the humility of God's word take care of our issues. Proverbs 24.10, if you give up when trouble comes, it shows that you are weak. If you give up when troubles come, it shows that you are weak. What we need to do is stand and fight. When you have troubles within your life and you are in chaos and you have mistakes that you have made and problems that you have, what we need to do as, as the armor of God, when you've done all to stand, stand. Okay, when you think that you're going to fail, stand. When you think that you've made mistakes, stand. Because the Bible says if we're not willing to stand and face our issue, face our past, accept what God is working within your life and take his ownership within our life, we're going to get stuck in the past because we keep on making excuses. Sometimes we just need to say ownership. It's mine. I am 50 years old. Stuff has happened, absolutely. Do I like everything that I did or everything people have done to me? Absolutely not. But from this moment on, I am not going to allow the people that meant it for bad to harm me any longer. I will not allow that to take place. And then the T is take inventory of my life. Take an inventory of my life. Learn from your mistakes. Failures could be either a friend or a foe. It determines your failure, whether what you respond to your failure. If your failure in your mind continues to be a failure, it will be a failure. But you can turn that failure into a foe if you learn from that. See, I believe experiences, God uses experiences to teach us things. And we've listed these experiences in front of you. It's in your bulletin. Sometimes God uses personal experiences. That means your family that you grew up with, people that you love, people that you minister with, people that makes choices in your families that you don't think is right, but yet you have experienced other failures. You've experienced moms and dads and brothers and sisters that have made stupid decisions, and you have seen the consequences to those decisions so you can learn from the experiences of people that have been close to you. Sometimes we learn that and we say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to have, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to do what they have done. So what I do, I'm going to learn from my personal experiences of my family and my close friends. God uses those experiences. And then sometimes he uses our vocational or our educational experiences to shape us. God has planned a life for you. And sometimes where he put us to work where he put us to go to school is exactly in God's plan to make you and mold you and to put you exactly where he wants you to go. He has used our experiences at the workplace, in our education place, in order for us to elevate to do what God wants us to do. So we can look at our vocation or our, our educational experiences and say, okay, God, well, what are you teaching me here? What are you planning for me into the future? Because where I have gone, vocationally and educationally, is preparing me to do something great for you. Shapes me, moves me, and makes me. And then our spiritual experiences have shaped us. Coming to church, going on retreats, as the teenagers go to youth camp, as children go to camps, as we do uh, different things at the church, whether it's women's ministries, men's ministries, whatever it is, the spiritual experience, how we see God in his lens is how we're going to accept 
God's working within our life. If we look at God through our spiritual lens as a God of the Bible that hates everything, that doesn't love me, that all it is is a list of no's and don'ts and you shouldn'ts, then we're going to look at God in a very negative light. But if we look at God as a loving father that brought down his son to die on the cross for my sins and he's given me grace and liberation and he's going to allow me to go to heaven and spend eternity with him away from the darkness of hell, I can look at God as a great, loving, graceful God. It all depends on the way that you perceive your spiritual condition. See, God loves us. He loves us so much that he doesn't want to put us in a dark punishment of hell absent from God he doesn't want that. What he wants to do, he wants to rescue us. He wants to rescue us of the punishment of hell and give to us the glories of heaven. He wants that for us. So when we perceive God, what do we perceive? Do we perceive somebody that says, no, you shouldn't do that? Or do we see, perceive somebody that says, yes, I want you in? It's all in the lens of the way that you perceive God. And God is a loving God. But here's how many of us perceive our experiences. It is through the painful experiences that have shaped us. The painful experiences. The times where we felt somewhat abandoned. The times that we felt that I have made a mistake. The times that we feel like God has turned his back. We feel like that we've done some stupid things. And the painful experiences have overwhelmed us. And God sometimes uses the desolate times within our life. The times where we feel like there's no hope and we feel like there's nobody here we feel like my prayers are being uttered to God, but yet God must be deaf. What do we do during those painful, depressive, intimate times within our life? We have to remember that in that time, when God is silent, God is always working. Sometimes in the most painful times, God is opening up our hearts to see things that we would have never experienced before we would have never seen things from his perspective unless we've gone through the pain and then when we wake up from that pain when we see what god has done and we open up our eyes we see people we see god working in a much different light because the painful the times that we are hurt the times that we feel like there's nobody around us is the time that God does the greatest work within our life. The painful experiences. When we look at those painful experiences, it does a couple things to us. It allows us to grow. It allows us to be more dependent on Him. It allows us to see forgiveness for what forgiveness truly is. And it puts a dependence, not on ourselves, but on God. Because when we are truly broken, and we're truly painful, when we feel like that there's no place else other than God, that's where we go, and that is our refuge. See, I, I truly believe a lot of teenagers never see God in our homes because we've never needed God in our homes. We have never sat down and said, man, we need to pray about this. We need God to work. But we, uh, we play God to our kids and we give everything, we do everything for them, we make sure everything's taken care of. But yet, if they have never needed God, they will never experience God. But if there's something that happens within the home, something that happens within the church, that you say, guys, we need, we, we need to pray about this. We need to talk about this. And then now we pray, and now we see God work. God does something, and then we can say, praise God for what he's done but if we never pray to God, if we never talk about God to our kids, what happens is our kids live their life without God. Oh, we go to church. We, we hear the preacher. We listen to some music. But have we ever needed God? Have we ever been on our face before God and said, I, if I don't have a taste of God, if I don't have a relationship with God, if he doesn't change my life, the kids are saying, I, I've never experienced God. I know the God of Bruce. I know that you love God. I know mom and dad may love God. But do you trust in God? See, we could be 40 or 50 or 60 years old. But it doesn't mean we have the maturity level of 40 or 50 or 60 years of age. 
Sometimes we have the maturity level of a one-year-old because we have never learned from experience. We experience the same stuff over and over and over and over again. And you're saying, why am I not growing? Because you're not allowing God to teach us. In the painful experiences of life, he does some of the greatest works. So the A represents act in faith. Act in faith. Act in faith. I love this. Act as if God's going to already do it. Say, I am going to live my life pleasing to God, knowing that God will do what I ask him to do. Act in faith. I, I, I love this story in Mark chapter 2 in, in the city of Capernaum when Jesus was teaching and the four guys was carrying the, the lame man. They carried him to Capernaum and they couldn't get into the house because the crowd was too much. So they couldn't get in. So they decided what they're going to do. They're going to climb up on the roof and there's a thatch roof. And they opened up the roof and they lowered the layman in right before Jesus. And, and you know the story that Jesus looked up at them and he, and he saw this lame man. And he healed his body. But he said something. He didn't say anything about the lame man. He looked at the men that carried the lame man and he said this. Because of your faith, I am going to heal his body. And sometimes we must just act in faith. Those four men did not know that they were going to get to Jesus. They acted as if they were going to get to Jesus. And in our life, we must act in faith. If I do what God wants me to do, I know God will do what he has promised me to do. He will change my life. If I want a fresh start, I have to know that God wants me to be successful. God wants me to live my life. God cares what I do. In Proverbs 29, 25, it says, being afraid of people can get you into trouble. Being afraid of people. Acting in faith is different than acting for people. Jo Joey said that just in worship experience. Let me put that into perspective in the worship. If, if, uh, you worship a song. I, I love that Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. That was, a, that was a great song, right? So some people during that song raised their hands in worship. You know, that, what that just means is I surrender. I, I, I want to I wanna surrender my hands to God. I want to surrender my life to God. That's all that means. Some people just sang. Some people just stood there. Some people, if they sang, people would walk away from them. It, it, it's all in perspective. But the idea is is I cannot let what somebody else thinks about me deter me from doing what God wants to do through me. If I am doing what God wants me to do, and I'm acting in faith, and I know that there's a reason for doing something, there will always be naysayers. Satan will always get somebody to say something or do something that will intimidate you, and it's very easy if we become people pleasers not to do what God wants us to do because we're afraid of what somebody will say, what somebody will think, or what somebody would act upon, or what they would do to us. What we must do is if we're going to act in faith, we have to say, I don't care. What I want to do is I want to honor God, and God will protect me in every area, in every issue. It starts a lot in church. Somebody gives their life to Christ. Somebody says they come to church and they give their life to Christ, but their spouse didn't. And their spouse thinks that Christianity thing is for the birds. So the person that gave their life to Christ has a decision to make. I love Jesus. Jesus transformed my life. Jesus gave me hope. Jesus gave me a future. But yet my spouse says that Christianity thing is not for me. So now you have a divided house and a divided home. Do you give up your faith or do you allow your faith to influence somebody to give their life to Jesus Christ? It's very easy to allow, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, you're right. Let's just not go to church. Let's forget the spiritual thing. No. If you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, our job, our mandate is to live our life pleasing to him so others can see Christ within us. Um, the Living Bible says this in, the, in Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of man is dangerous trap, 
But to trust in God means safety. To trust in God means safety. When everything else can fall apart, we can still be safe. And then refocus. Refocus. Refocus just means, in, in the idea is, is I want to have a clear direction of where I'm going. I want to know exactly what God wants me to do, and I need to refocus the direction that God wants me to go. In Proverbs 4.23, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Refocus. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. What I think is usually what I'm going to do. The Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It goes in from the head, goes to the heart, and out of the heart, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We have to guard our thoughts. The Bible says we must take every thought captive. Because if we start believing the deception of Satan, and we say, you know what? You know, I, I know I want to do what God wants me to do. I know I need to start over. I know that I'm not doing everything just, just right. But you know what? It's, I, I'll try. But you know what? I really don't think I have to really reorganize and prioritize. I think if I just make a couple tweaks here and a couple tweaks there, I think I'll be okay. Satan has just told you that the Word of God is a lie. And Satan has just told you that you can live your own life and the flesh is what you need to worry about. You don't need to worry about God. Because if we understand that God wants you to radically change your life to glorify him, and Satan or somebody says, you don't need it, you're good enough. You know what? We're never good enough. We're never going to be perfect. We're always going to sin. But what we have to do is realize that God wants to move us to be more pleasing to him. He'll forgive us every time. He'll love us and unconditionally love us. But we must refocus our life, our actions, and put God where he needs us to be. And then T, trust. We have to trust in God. We have to trust that the outcome will mean success. We cannot put this, this whole solution into place and think that God doesn't love us. We have to trust that God will take us and keep us, and love us, and help us. The Christianity thing is hard. Living your life for God, it's tough. It's very difficult. Zechariah 4, 6 says, you will, not be, you will not succeed by your own strength, or by your power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You will not be successful in your own power. If I trust in God, I have to allow God's power to work within my life. Whenever somebody becomes a Christian, they became a new person in Christ. The Bible says the old things are passed away. Behold, a new thing has come within our life. There's a difference between the old and the new when you gave your life to Christ. And there's two things that are brand new. Number one, you're forgiven. Your sins are gone. And then, part of the triune Godhead we call it the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Comes within your life. And the Holy Spirit within your life gives you direction, gives you promptings, gives you understanding, opens up your heart and opens up your life of when to say things and how to say things to people. It gives you memory, remembrance to, to utter the words of God. You speak, you communicate, and you live in the Spirit. That is the new life. That is, old things are passed away. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to see things from a brand new perspective. And we can see things a brand new perspective. We start a brand new life. There's a poem called The Fellowship of the Unashamed. Many of you have heard it. Many of you have probably read it. But it says this. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living sight, walking, small planning, smooth knees, 
colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotion, or popularity. I don't have the right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live in the present, learn by faith, love by patience, live by prayer, and love by power. My pace is set, my goal is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my, compassion, my companions are few, my guide reloadable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, or deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of my advers advers adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander at the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I'm preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the name of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go into his return, give until I drop, preach until I know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me because my colors will be clear. That is a child of God that says nothing else matters. I want to walk into the new year with a brand new life. When Jesus looks at me compared to last year, last month, or last week, he looks deep within my soul and he knows the very desires of my heart. He knows what I want to do. A smile comes upon his face. Why? It's because he knows what I want. I want new. I want a fresh start. I want Jesus to be more important to me than anything else that I could possibly do. He puts a smile on his face because he knows my heart. Do you need a fresh start? Do you need something new? Do you need to look at God through the lens of God instead of your lens or people's lens? Because if we don't see God for who he is, if we don't understand what Jesus did for us and for our salvation and the forgiveness of our sins, we cannot see God until we first see Jesus. We cannot get to God until we first go through the cross. If you have never seen Jesus high and lifted up on the cross, if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior because of the blood that he has shed for your sins, you can never see God. You can never start over. You don't understand. It all starts with Jesus. It all starts with his forgiveness. It all starts with this simple prayer. Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I need you. I accept you. I understand that the blood that you shed on that cross was the cleansing agent for my life and for my sins. And I accept that gift of salvation. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Lord just means first place. Savior means atoned for. You saved me. You atoned. You paid the price for my sins. And now... I want to live my life for you. If the church would ever get to the point, if this church would ever get to the point that the children of God that sit in the pews and behind the pulpit of this church accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Satan would tremble at the power of the church. You know what he does? He laughs. He laughs because we do not understand the power that we possess. We have the power to transform hell at our disposal. And it was given us 2,000 years ago. And it's in the name that's above every other name that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We must accept that power. We must use that power. And we must let that power motivate us into a future.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for your love. I pray that you'll guide within our lives. And Lord, as we look into the future and we start thinking about what you are going to do within us and for us, I pray that deep within our soul that you'll give to us a motivation to start. Start fresh and new. You are a God of second chances. We've all failed you, and we will continue to fail you. But you love us. Look deep within our souls and convict of us of our sins. Allow us to be unashamed of what you can do through us and for us. We love you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Next week, our topic is new. How to keep it fresh and new. How to not only start something, but how to continue it. How to make it fresh long term. How not to just be uh, something that we do on Sunday, but how can we make it alive every day of our life. That starts next week. Okay? Pastor Alex.